Now we have Isabeau Birindelli, head of the Department of Mathematics at Università di Roma La Sapienza. She got her PhD at New York University, I guess, yes. under the guidance of Louis Nirenberg. And since then, she has given fundamental contributions in the field of mathematical analysis. She has been visiting several international research institutes, academia, and universities, it entailing collaborations with several international scientists throughout Europe, US, India, and Chile. She is member of international committees and panels. More recently, she has also investigated the pioneering relationship between mathematics, design, architecture, and fashion. Please. Uh, good evening. Well, first of all, I want to say a couple of words because I'm not going to thank Daniele, <laughs> who made, uh, told me, no, you know, no, this is a talk for general public. Uh, you will have, uh, anyone could be following you. <laughs> not mentioning that I would have in the audience a Fields medalist, uh, uh, Claudio Brochesi, <laughs> Alfio Guarteroni, <laughs> and uh, so you really somehow played a trick on me. <laughs> so, I, so this talk is really intended for non-mathematician. So contrary to what uh, Alfio did, so if mathematician wants to fall asleep, I won't be offended, but <laughs> <laughs> I hope some of the other people will uh, listen. So, uh, okay. so what I'm going to do, in fact, is, uh, yes, is a sort of a botanical game. Uh, in my opinion, probably wrong, uh, botanists do that. They look at flowers and then they say, well, the difference between uh, Daisy and uh, Margaret is because it's the shape of the thing. So I would like to describe, to do the same thing, but instead of looking at uh, plants or flowers, uh, to look at uh, art or architecture, design, or whatever that comes into my mind. And uh, so let's start. But the idea is to strike, the difference with the botanist is that I would like to use mathematical words, mathematical definition, to define the same object that in fact are not usually described in this way. Okay. So let me start. So, you know, mathematicians have a fixation about definition. So we cannot do anything if we not, don't start by defining what we're talking about. So the object I'm going to describe may not be smooth surfaces, but let me tell you that what we call a smooth surface somehow, I'm not going to be very precise, is an object that if you look close enough, it looks like a surface, so like a, like a plane, okay? So you look close enough to a ball and then it looks like a plane. And so these that you see here are very no, well known, a ball, a torus, a chambella, a cylinder, okay? And these are smooth, okay, because they're smooth. Okay, instead, surfaces don't need to be smooth, okay? So these are examples of surfaces that are not smooth. So they have points where, even though you look very close, if you take a cone, you see you have this point there, it's not smooth, it's never going to look like a, a, a plane, okay? So this, this surface there, the cone, has a point which is singular. Instead, this uh, surface by Morandini has a, a, a singular along a straight line, okay? This goes up and down, and so these are... Yeah. And the conchoid instead is, is very, this is defined by a mathematical equation, but looks like a, a shell, so we call this a conchoid. This is another example of a surface which is not smooth. Okay, so the, somehow we mathematicians try to, to define this concept. Now, uh, uh, the, the title of my talk was Unexpected Manifolds, because manifolds want to describe objects that are not flat somehow. So you, you can describe surfaces or you want to describe curves. We, we saw this morning this curve. <laughs> curve can be what you study at school or Brownian motion or Lorentz. Uh, uh, so it's 
it doesn't have to be exactly what you think, but what it is is that if you look, again, if you look close enough, it is a little bit like a straight line, okay, or a line anyway. So this is what you expect. But so what can we do with with the curve? Okay, we can, for example, let's think of spirals. You see, spirals have inspired architecture for a long time, okay? Uh, as you can see here, very simple, this, uh, this, uh, the litus is this uh, spiral here is the one that constructs the, 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 the ionic capital. Well, of course, you can spiral. Instead of staying flat, you can start spiraling in the space, in the whole space. And so you go towards God, if you think believe in God, or on the Earth, if you are on the sphere. Okay? And this fact of uh, uh, thinking of the spiral as uh, uh, something that elevates toward uh, God is a, is a fact that is, well, of course, spirals are present in nature, but uh, interestingly, uh, you see in the, in the Islamic art, the in, in Islamic world, the, 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 the spiral was to describe infinity because this idea that you can con continue turn and turn and turn. And so the, there's very old minaret that use uh, this uh, uh, concept of infinity to, to represent somehow God without representation because you couldn't represent. Okay, so it's this geometrical feeling that is given by this idea of the spiral. Okay, so these are simple example, but okay, uh, uh, closer to us, at least closer to me, <laughs> this is uh, Santiva La Sapienza by Borromini. Uh, so Sapienza is the university where I am uh, right now, where Claudio Borghesi has been for a long time, and Michele Emmer. And this was really the first place where Sapienza was. This is drawn by Borromini. Borromini was, a myst was very mystic, his uh, way of... Uh, and uh, he loved, uh, he was very interested in uh, geometry, but he really thought that geometry was the instrument to understand God. And so that's how he represented it in his, uh, um, so for him, and this uh, mystical spiral was the spiral that goes toward wisdom. At least sapienza you can translate in wisdom, but also knowledge. So this is the interesting this idea of uh, the spirit that goes up in flame in following the spiral. Okay, uh, but uh, we don't stop with uh, the end of the face in a certain <laughs> sense, uh, because even during the socialist movement, uh, Tatlin had to build this, uh, uh, this uh, monument for the third international and his idea has been to use the spiral of course the new uh, the idea was to do it was a propaganda for the new socialist society and this so was an elevation not towards god but towards the russian people in the glorious prospect of the bolshevik uh, revolution and uh, and one can could go on uh, there is there's been i don't know if but of course how not to quote <laughs> uh, Marcello Morandini, who has been using a lot uh, of spiral in his work. I, I was amazed by, I also received, was very, had the fortune of receiving a volume. And uh, when I looked at it, I was impressed of how many spirals were there. And uh, I believe that here instead, I it's not at all towards God, I guess it's just, uh, towards maybe concentration or whatever anyone wants to see in it. I'm not an art historian. So let's continue. Again, here we have uh, another uh, uh, mm, uh, spiral by Morandini. And but also, you see, I wanted to show you this spiral. This spiral is in uh, this dress by Roberto Capucci. And um, uh, you see, you have the spiral that goes on. But if you ask a mathematician if this is a spiral, he's not going to say it's a spiral. This is a ruled surface, right? In a certain sense, it's a spiral, but it's also a ruled surface. So what is a, a ruled surface? So ruled surfaces, you have another one. This one was used also by <laughs> Alfio. Uh, are surfaces where you, at each point, you can uh, pass a line that is all included in the surface. So when you think of straight line, you think of something straight, right? But interesting, root surfaces, which are made by straight line, are not uh, flat at all, okay? You can see these are all surfaces in which you can put straight line and they're complete, this straight line completely covers the surface. And this is very interesting because 
This, you can understand that in architecture, this allows to uh, build, uh, so other example of, um, of uh, ruled surfaces. Uh, so, of course, this is not complete, this is not a surface, these are just straight line, but this is why I called it rigate in divenire, because the we mentally close the surface, so even if the, uh, you only have a few straight lines, you really want to, to, to construct the rest of the surface in your mind. And the fact that you, you do it uh, through, uh, just that Morandini has used just a few lines, really seems to uh, want to, um, how could I say, um, insist on the fact that the surface was really a ruled surface, a rigata. So rigate happen to be uh, in many places. Uh, you can imagine construction with rigate. Uh, this is a, um, a construction of uh, Le Corbusier, and you can see very well. Now I'll explain better these two later. But you know, ruled surfaces in Italian are called rigate, and uh, you all know PP rigate, but these are not a ruled surface, okay? <laughs> because they're not straight line. <laughs> so just uh, uh, just a little joke. But you see, the, the in architecture, regatta are very ruled surfaces are very important because uh, they allow you to construct buildings that don't look flat or straight. But in order to construct a building, you, you need the construction techniques that include usually beams, you know, and so these are straight line. And so having to do uh, um, uh, uh, you see, you see very well how to use the fact that in order to construct uh, um, buildings, you need straight line. And so how to do a non-flat building, not flat surfaces, one way is to use uh, uh, ruled surfaces. Okay. And here you have other example because the hyperboloid is uh, the hyperboloid in, in architecture is very much used that you see in different period, different places. I mean, and uh, I, I I love this. Um, th this is the design by Candela, Felix Candela, and this is really a, a sequence of uh, hyperboloids put one next to the other. And uh, it's interesting because you you don't think of this as straight lines, eh? somehow, it's, it's really uh, forgetting. And I think this happens a lot also in the, the work that we can see around, uh, the, this impression of using straight line in order to, to, to do uh, uh, pictures that have everything but straight lines in, in them. Okay, so here are other, uh, other uh, ruled surfaces, but uh, you see, once you start thinking about root surfaces, you see the idea of the mathematician was, well, you have this very simple object, a straight line, you move it around and you can construct such amazing things. So why move around only straight line? Why not do a vibration to of other objects but the straight line? You can do it with circle, we can do it with any other. You can do it with other ruled surfaces. And so this is how you, you can construct fiber bundles. So um, I know this is the wrong picture. Why there is this picture? Ah, this is the picture. Okay, so the idea was, is here is, you see at each, each point, instead of putting a straight line, you put a, um, a cone, which itself is a ruled surface, okay? And so of course you cannot, actually realize it by putting it on every single point. But if you put it in enough points, you give the idea of what a fiber bundle should be. So, but let's start from the beginning. So in a certain sense, as I was saying, you start by uh, going, uh, uh, fixing a surface, and then on each, at each point, what can you put? You can put the thing that looks more like the surface. So for example, the straight line or the, 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 the tangent plane. Well, this is what is called a tangent bundle, okay? And, uh, okay, and so what I have on me is a tangent bundle. You see on every uh, place I have my tangent. <laughs> and uh, this is also by Capucci, this is the original drawing. And uh, the, the, um, the picture I show you does a regatta at the beginning by Morandini, in fact, is exactly the construction of a tangent uh, bundle. Okay, 
uh, other, other example of, uh, of uh, fiber bundles. And as, but as I was saying, why not do the same thing? Take a, a curve, take a, a circle, and that at each point of the circle, you put another circle. So what you construct is just uh, uh, a torus, uh, in Italian, a chambelle, <laughs> or donuts, if you want. Okay, and then at this point, there's no limit in your imagination of what you can do. So as I was saying, this is in each fiber, you have this sort of spiraling, spiraling cone, which is itself a ruled surface. Uh, I don't know, things are not going as I thought. Uh, but here are other, other possibility, okay? Always by, these are uh, designed by Roberto Capucci. And you see here you have singular, fiber bundle here, instead you have this uh, spezzata here. And, uh, but all of these can be somehow mathematically de described, okay. Uh, here we have example by Morandini, instead you see this, he has taken the same shape and then put it along the, this uh, circle and uh, forming a completely new shape. You probably don't see the original one. And, um, um, okay, uh, I just, uh, I don't know how much time I have. Anyway, I'll, I'm going to go through fast. What I would like to, to, to give is this idea of um, uh, isometric uh, surfaces. So uh, two, two, uh, two surfaces are isometric if you can deform one into another without, without, changing the shape of the design that you have on it. You see, this picture changes completely, but the shape of each single square stays exactly the same, okay? So there is an isometry with this between these two figure. So this means that this surface that you see here, which is, uh, um, um, uh, and the, the picture that you see, so this is an helicoid and this is, um, I have a, a catenoid, are in fact the same, the same surface. You can move one to the other. And uh, um, you see the interest of this uh, object, you see here how it's done. It's done with a soap bubble. So now I'm embarrassed to say this in front of Michele Emmer, who is the, the world expert <laughs> in <laughs> soap bubbles. Uh, but soap bubbles have this uh, quality that they actually take the form of minimal surfaces. And so, see if this is a minimal surface, I don't, I'm not going to say what is a minimal surface, but you can imagine from the fact that this is uh, a soap bubble, then that one is also. So we, what does this mean? This means, for example, that the famous lamp of Bruno Munai, the Falkland, has really the shape of a catenoid, because uh, this is a natural shape that is taken by the lamp. This is done, you know, with, uh, Munari went to, um, a uh, uh, sock factory and said that he wanted to make a lamp out of their, uh, of what they fa fabric. And so this is how it came out. So this is the natural shape. Y you didn't, he didn't design this. This is what happened because of the material that is chosen. So this is so some sort of natural, uh, minimal, uh, spontaneous shape, he called them. And of course, I, let me, I'm always going back between architecture, art, mathematics. Uh, so the, you see, this, what is a catenoid? A catenoid is a surface that you obtain in this way. You take a uh, catenaria, which is just the same, the shape of a chain, and, uh, and you turn it on itself. But this so is a natural shape again. And so the good idea is to make bridges that have exactly the shape of the catenaria. And um, so, this is a way of to economize uh, uh, work, uh, risks of, uh, of, of uh, uh, and cost, okay? It's the fact that you choose this, uh, this shape. And this is the most amazing example of use of, uh, of uh, catenarie, because this is a Sagrada Familia of, um, by Gaudí. And, uh, uh, how is this built? 
Well, the design at the beginning, what he did, there was no rendering with computers and so on, okay? So he took this little sand uh, uh, weight, so he weighted little boxes of sand that were linked together by ropes. So if you take a uh, rope and you put sand, it will take a certain shape. And so he put all the right size of uh, right weight and he created the Sagrada Familia upside down, just using the, the gravity. And at that point he had the shape and then he could design it and then do the construction on the other side. But this was the natural shape, so this was the best shape he could do to uh, simplify the, the, the whole construction. And of course another example is uh, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral, but not the dome that you see in London, because it's the, the real shape. So this is the part that makes it stand, and then there is this sort of fake cupola on top of it, but the real cupola has the shape of, um, of a, a catenoid. Okay, so these were examples of different manifolds, and of course, I invite every one of you of going around and uh, finding which manifolds are described around us and looking at them using the mathematical tools we know if we are a mathematician or that we should <laughs> know if we, would, we should learn if we are not in order to see the object around us in uh, different ways. Uh, I was very impressed by how much uh, how many of the uh, of the um, uh, of the uh, art uh, produced by Morandini can be interpreted with the mathematical concept, and uh, uh, so I think that beside the work of uh, that Alfio did with in comparing it with music, I think it would be very interesting to make a, a sort of uh, mathematical description of at least. Uh, one of each in the kind of uh, work you have done. So uh, I just uh, going go to go through to say that uh, one can add the topology, so put holes in things and then uh, the, the shape become more and more complex if you start putting uh, uh, stratified uh, manifolds and uh, other kind of shape, it's, it's very, amusing once you start to look at the world around you using mathematical terms uh, it's really uh, an infinite uh, game that one can do some of them i had the fun of you know writing the equation and some just uh, the description and uh, so uh, uh, but uh, so let me conclude so the conclusion is a little bit in the sense of what uh, Michele was uh, started to saying uh, that uh, um, so mathematical, so the question, the big question to me is, okay, the, the you've seen these dresses of Capucci. Capucci has no idea of what is uh, a tangent bundle. He has no idea of what even how to do a sum. Let's not talk about geometry. And he has clearly an amazing geometrical uh, understanding. I don't know about... Uh, uh, Marcello Morandini, I don't know if he has a mathematical background, but I don't think it's needed. I mean, if, if he has, maybe it helps, but maybe he doesn't. And uh, so, uh, but at the same time, you have this impression that mathematician and artist arrive at the same conclusion. So can we say that this is because uh, uh, things exist and we see them from different angles or simply because our ability to think is the same whether we use it for mathematics or we use it for art. So in a certain sense, uh, I'm not want, I don't really want to, to give an answer. And the second question is, um, can we really think that the fact of putting some mathematics into art enhance the value of the art or it's just another instrument? I mean, you can use very beautiful colors and do awful pictures, or you can, uh, uh, no, or so, uh, so it's not the mean that actually make the artist. But once you have a great artist, the fact that he has this mathematical insight or that he puts some mathematics in it, whether willingly, I mean, whether knowing he's doing it or not, uh, does this enhance the quality of the art? So this is the... Uh, uh, 
the, the two questions with which I want to finish. Thank you for your attention.